Hello everyone, good evening and thanks for tuning in. My name is Cassandra and on behalf of Nikon, we're excited to bring the Nikon experience to you, whether you're at home, on the train or anywhere else in the world right now. You see, the change of pace in our world is accelerating in present time. More and more prevalent, we're seeing the power of digital creators Hello share everyone. their creativity and uniqueness with the world right now, you know, in amazing high quality. As a creator, you want to be equipped with reliable and efficient technologies to express your creative vision. And having a trusty and reliable Nikon camera, such as the Z6, is excellent for video outputs besides stills. Thanks to its various features, such as the 8-bit 4K UHD, 10-bit analog, and 12-bit raw video capability. But we understand that besides your camera, there are many other tools needed to realize your artistic vision from lighting, audio, production software, right down to even the, the storage you know, for, for your files. You know, these are essentially tools that are part of your workflow integration. And this is what the Experience Nikon series is all about for creators like you, creativity and collaboration. So each week we'll have about 30 minutes on board our, a brand partner to share one specific tool to help you make the best out of your intended video creations. And to kick off the first session, we have invited a global cinematic LED lighting solution, Aperture, to share more about lighting in videography. And representing Aperture is Jimmy, the head of sales and marketing for Asia Pacific. Over to you, Jimmy. Hi, thanks, Kasia. Hi, guys. How are you doing? My name is Jimmy. Um, I come from a lighting manufacturer brand called Aperture. Um, I'm not sure whether some of you all might have heard of us. Um, I think we are known a little bit more in the videos and the motion picture side of things. We started out actually about, you know, um, eight to nine years uh, ago, 20, that was somewhere around 2010, 2011. And also, I'm a little nervous if I'm speaking a little bit too fast, just let me know, I'll slow down. Right, I think we started about eight to nine years ago. Uh, I think back then we were making a variety of equipment, not just limited to lighting. We made few monitors. Uh, even microphones, follow focuses. But ever since about three years ago, we've consistently just focused on making lighting solutions uh, for content, you know, creators, videographers, um, and even filmmakers. And, you know, we're really, really thankful that, you know, we have partners like Nikon, who is actually just, you know, they loaned us their new cameras. Um, great. I mean, that, that camera shoots very well in, in low lighting conditions. And today we're just going to talk about some key lighting ideas and as well as small, as well as a small little practical uh, as exercise at the end of it, where you can use it to light some of your home, you know, um, Skype conversations, tele uh, telecommunications, you know, uh, sessions that you might be doing with your uh, with your offices. Yeah. So shall we jump into um, today's presentation that I've I've, I've got actually? With yes. Guys? Ready go. All right. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So. Right, jumping in. This is lighting with Nikon um, proper, and it's so fast. It's really sep September already. So I've actually put together a couple of pictures for you guys. These are actually users who are using Aperture, you know, to light uh, essentially their work, you know, their portfolio, some of the live events. Uh, we have, you know, uh, this was actually a live event over at Suntec City in Singapore not that long ago. So they use a couple. A variety of lights to light for an online you know event you also have you know uh, for fashion shoots uh, the lights are usable if you have a fashion show as well you need to create something like a stage lighting you see that on the right hand side and then in the middle it's more of uh, this is actually from our user in korea they're using this to light something more of a storytelling you know type of a nature kind of a narrative uh, feature film kind of a vibe yeah uh, these are also some of our representatives also from Taiwan as well. This is a bar scene. If I'm not wrong, this one was actually lit by film students, right? So not just also uh, from professionals, but even for film schools, we've seen a good, you know, mixture of people who are using our lights. And they've gone all the way to Korean, you know, music videos. I Actually, to be honest with you, I don't really know this singer, but I know she's very famous. And we caught a glimpse of her actually, uh, you know, whoever was... Whoever was DP on that should actually use a couple of our lights yeah, and so on and so forth. But anyway, in essence, you just need to know that as a company, this is kind of where we are right now. We have uh, regional offices across the world. Uh, most of these offices are actually 
aimed at supporting users, especially when you run into issues, uh, you know, equipment failure on set. That's where you can bring to some of these offices and actually look for us. We'll be happy to actually help you service our lights out. Uh, these are some of the bigger studio lights that you may or may not have seen on set. But today, uh, in a little exercise that we're going to do later, I'm going to show you some of these small lights that are not exactly shown in this picture. So just need to know that we do make a variety of lighting solutions. It doesn't matter whether you're just starting out or you might be uh, the very consumer, you know, professional. So four key ideas. I'm not going to stress you out. Today, we're just going to talk about four main key lighting ideas that you have to take away from today. The position of the light uh, matters a lot. The, quali the quality of the light can matter as well. They are used in different circumstances. The intensity of the light as well as the color of the light. As you'll notice in this room, uh, there are actually a couple of colors uh, just in this frame alone. But anyway, I'm going to get, get into that. Let's start with the position of the light. Where the light actually is placed uh, can matter. I understand actually we have quite a number of Nikon shooters who are watching this. You know, you might be you, may, you might be coming from a stills background and saying, I know lighting, yeah, it's three-point lighting. Um, yes, that that's some that's a, a, a basic uh, framework that uh, that actually is applied, uh, especially when it comes to the world of stills. But when you move over into a video and motion picture, things are slightly different when it comes to lighting. You just need to understand that in motion picture, when we put a light there in certain places, they are meant as, you know, light motivations in the sense that if I put a light at the window shining into a room, what I'm really actually trying to do is I'm trying to create daylight that's coming into the room. If I put a fill in front, you know, of a, uh, of a, uh, let's say for example, I'm working on my desk right now and I put a little small little pocket light near my laptop. Uh, what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to recreate, you know, I'm, I'm trying to simulate that computer light that is falling on my face. You might ask, why can't I do something like that? Well, we'll, go, we'll get into that later. I'm starting to get a little bit carried away. <laughs> but let me just drum through some simple ideas. And these are actually still frames taken from some of the uh, movies that you might have watched. You just need to understand that when the light is placed right smack in front of you, just like this, like the picture that you see over here, uh, this is this refers to a flatter style of lighting. You don't notice any shadows on a person's face, right? The left side of the uh, left side of the cheek, right side of the cheek, they are quite evenly lit. There's hardly any shadows. This is what we call a flatter lighting style. You see this used a lot more on television studios. They have their place. Don't don't feel that this is any you know inferior to what I'm going to show you next. Just need to know that. This is what we call a flatter type lighting style. You see it a lot in a lot of uh, television networks and studios. Um, one uh, another type of lighting style is what we call the butterfly or the paramount lighting style. Uh, this is very very popular with portrait photographers. So I'm not gonna, I won't be able to have time to ask you questions. So I'm gonna review essentially the light is placed right overhead, the subject pointing down towards her at almost a 45 degree angle. You can tell because of the slightly the, the shadows underneath her chin. This is actually quite flattering. If you're working with big studio lights, you want to take, uh, if you don't really know where to start, you know, if you only have one light and you're trying to work with a human subject in a studio, usually a butterfly would be very safe. Uh, it's not just lighting the person, but you can see that there's a little nice little eye light in the person's eye, right? That's, that's actually very complimenting. Um, what usually some photographers uh, might do is also they might put something like a bounce board, something like a styrofoam board that's placed underneath the neck just to fill in the shadows underneath. Right? So from, pair, from a butterfly lighting, you go into something like a clamshell, right? Clamshell. Uh, I think the photographers, uh, especially the portrait photographers, probably will know what I'm talking about, right? Right, now I'm just going to jump very quickly into some of the other lighting styles. There is a broad side and a short side lighting. So depending on where you place the light. So for this thing to work, and you might ask, when would I use something like a broad side or a short side lighting? I've never heard of it before. Let's say, for example, the most common is when you do an interview or you're just, uh, you're just questioning, or you're just asking someone. So what we'll do is usually we'll have the subject, you know, tilt their head a little bit, you know, off center, slightly away from the center to the side. The reason for doing this is, to, is, is sort of to create this, uh, this 3D feel to the human subject. Because just keep in mind that whether we are watching on our phones or watching content on computers, it is still within a 2D kind of a space. So how do we make something that's 3D, like us, look 3D on a 2D platform? 
we actually angle them slightly away and we choose to control where we want to put the light. So when we are lighting the side where the part where the majority of the face is facing towards the camera, this is essentially the broadside lighting, right? So essentially, if the camera is faced here, I turn slightly away, this will be my broadside. And you might guess the other side will be my short side lighting. So in, in this particular frame, if you look at it, right, Indiana Jones is looking straight at the camera, but the light is actually hitting him on the side. So you're choosing a, a shorter side lighting. This is something you see a lot more in, um, in cinematic movies, right? They leave a sense of mystery. Whereas a broadside lighting might be something you see more on corporate videos where you want to portray someone that's very uh, open, someone that's very positive. You want to create that good vibes. You might choose something like a broadside lighting. Uh, just keep in mind, you know, uh, be flexible, know what you are going for. The reason then, of course, I think if we jump into something like backlight, backlight is a very popular choice. It doesn't matter whether you come from stills or motion picture. Backlight is, uh, is extremely useful because of the fact that it creates separation. When you put a light in the back, it creates the idea of uh, something that's in front, something that's behind. Some people refer it to it as separation. Some people refer it to it, to it as depth, right? As depth. Uh, if you're coming from a stills kind of a background, you, you notice that this type of lighting style is very common in food products. Uh, product style uh, lighting as well. Backlighting is probably one of my, it's probably in fact my favorite choice of lighting. If I don't really know where to put a light, uh, I would actually go for something like a backlight first. This principle can also be applied, say for example, even if you are just someone who's a hobbyist, I'm going to the picnic with my, with my family over the weekend. If I want to take a group picture with the rest of my family and we want to look good, how should I actually place you know, my, my subjects and things like that? Generally, you see a lot of, uh, you know, portrait photographers when they go out and shoot underneath the sun, they'll usually have the subjects back facing the sun. So number one reason for that is so that they don't actually squint their eyes. Pretty much if they were facing the sun, they, they probably can't open up their eyes enough to look at the camera anyway. So we have their backs turned towards, the, uh, turned towards the sun. Then what about the front, right? So the camera will automatically expose for, say, for example, the back. Then essentially this will leave the front just completely in the shadows. And this is where you will put in something like a fill, like a white piece of paper, like a bounce card to fill in the shadows. So on certain angles, you may even be able to move the camera and the lens, right? You may be able to move the camera and the lens to a point where you get a nice flare. So sometimes when we do motion picture as well, you, you might often see, especially for event and wedding videographers, they like to put a light at the back of the subject so that when they move the camera, whether if it's you know on a gimbal or, it's a, or if it's on a slider, they move in and then they review that nice flare that hits the lens you know, right at the back. So these are just um, some ideas, but what that person really is trying to do is just to make use of the basic, you know, of the lighting principle that there's actually a backlight in there. So far, do we have questions? Yeah. Um, no. Okay. So far, so good. Okay, all good, right? So these are just some basic lighting positions, right? We've covered some lighting positions. Now we just go into something that's slightly different. So on the second point, this is quality of the lights. What do I mean quality? You mean like a, like a, like a, like a Wagyu grade A, grade B? Uh, not quite. Uh, we're referring to something like this. Now I, I have two pictures over here. I can tell you that there is a difference in quality of light between these two, you know, pictures that you see over here. I don't mean that, uh, you know, the, the one taken on the left is shot with a D810 and then the one on the right is, uh, uh, is a Nikon Z6, that kind of thing. But I'm talking about look carefully at the shadows on the person. You notice that the shadows are more pronounced. It's more obvious on the, on the left, right? You notice from highlights, to shadows, it's more obvious. You can see that there's a cut here. Whereas on the right-hand side, the transition from highlights to shadows are softer. You don't even notice that there's actually a transition. So this is actually what we're referring to. The, the light on the right, uh, on the left is harder. The light, the quality of light on the right is softer, right? And when we mean soft lights, it's something like this. So you can, just by looking at this, wow, you know, you can see that uh, this is, by the way, if you didn't know, this is uh, Kira Knightley, right? Kira, Kira Knightley. Uh, she starred in a lot of uh, a, a lot of films. I think most of you will know her from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, right? So you can see that um, 
everywhere you look throughout the frame itself, you can see that the light is extremely soft because the first thing you notice is there's hardly any shadows on her. There's hardly any shadows on her. And what I usually will do is if you are trying to learn about lighting, look closely in their eyes. Great DPs and cinematographers will sometimes give away what they are using to light the subject from the from the reflection in the eye. So just from, from this alone, I can see that there's actually a rectangular softbox that is being used to lit her. You can see that it looks a little bit rectangular, which is why some of you might have that question, you know, why does Aperture only make softboxes which are round instead of something that's rectangular? Rectangular softboxes are there to replicate something like a window light, right? Uh, most of the times when we look at something, the eye light or the catch light will be round. It just looks more natural. Uh, and definitely not like a ring, uh, not like a ring, which, uh, which I mean, some people, I mean, there are some beauty vloggers who like, you know, ring lights, but um, actually when you put it in front, uh, you know, put it in front of a subject, it does look a little bit unnatural because what we're really trying to go for is to create like a round, you know, eye light or catch light. So this generally, you just need to know that it's of a softer, softer light quality. It's more flattering, but soft light is extremely hard to control. Soft light tends to spill all over the place. It is much harder to control. If let's say if I if I only want to light a certain area soft, and I don't want the sides, you know, uh, I I want these uh the the light on the not to fall on the sides. Generally, it's a little bit more work to if you're using a soft light compared to something that is a hard light, right? So this, uh, if you're the, uh, I think most of us who have been born after um. This was uh, shown, this was in 1946, Casablanca, right? So back then when we talked about film, uh, most of it was still in black and white. It films uh, some of you. The light quality, you can see that uh, immediately where you have your shadows is where you have your, uh, where you have your shadows is where uh, next to it, you have your highlights. The transition is extremely quickly. Right, the transition is extremely quickly. Quickly, so, um, oops, sorry about that. So transition is extremely quickly. The light that's being used here is harder. You also notice that just how we use a female to show soft light and a hard light to show uh, uh to be represented by a male. Generally, I would say it's not that you know a soft light cannot be used on a male subject, but generally male subjects can take hard light a little bit better, uh, because. Uh, generally hard light, we use it more in situations where we want to show a bit of rawness, edginess, and male subjects tend to be able to carry that a little bit better. And it's more flattering for female subjects to, to have soft light on them, right? Especially if you're doing beauty commercials, uh, makeup tutorials, that's part of, you know, that's one of the reasons why. So far, do we have any questions, uh, Sandra? You, you actually just explained it. <laughs> there oh. was a request for you to sort of, you know, connect, uh, you know, the mood, the meaning, you know, yes. using different kind of lights. And you actually just explained it. Do you see the question? Yeah, I saw it. I saw the question. Oh, okay. I thought it was just some timely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good on that. All right. Awesome. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm glad I was able to help you. So, you know, do, do understand uh, that, you know, we, later we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to show you some equipment, but before we go into the equipment, at least understand the thought process, you know, uh, how it is to light, you know, why we are working with certain lights on set. All right, so we've talked about the position, we've talked about the quality. Next one we're going to talk about is the brightness or the, the technical term we refer to is intensity, right? How intense is the light? When the light is not very intense, you have shadows. When it's, uh, when it's more intense, you create uh, things like high, highlights. But the two of them actually work together to create what we call contrast, right? Sometimes you're always wondering, how do I get something to look very cinematic? Uh, contrast, depth, separation, um, out of focusness, bokeh, all these are little, little tools that you need to combine to make something, you know, uh, feel to create that cinematic look. But at the end of the day, you still need to remember that compared, you know, from video to stills, with video, there is the element of storytelling, right? There's the element of storytelling, right? But anyway, let's just go back. I'm, I'm now starting to get a little bit carried away. Okay, so let's come back to the idea of something that is uh, uh, darker and something that's brighter. We're talking about contrast here. When you talk about contrast, and if you have a chance to go to film school, one of the areas they'll cover is lighting ratio. So let's look at this female subject. 
if you just focus on the amount of light on a face, this is this will be something closer to flat style lighting. So I've covered that a little bit, you know, earlier on. Like that's a little bit flatter. You notice that her left cheek and her right cheek generally are quite evenly exposed, right? It feels like there's equal amount of light on her face. Yeah. Now I'm going to show you a second picture, right? And uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, the ratio first on the right hand side. You notice that there has been some light that has been taken away from the left side of a cheek. So the left side actually is a little bit darker. So in this case, we will refer this to two is to one. That means that the right side is one stop brighter, meaning it's double double the brightness of the left cheek, meaning make it makes this a two is to one ratio. Right, there's also four is to one, there's eight is to one, there's 16 is to one, right? So uh, just keep that in mind when we're talking about lighting ratios, this is what it means. To, to make something feel cinematic, um, and anyway, I have, I have to be careful uh, because there, 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 there is, I think the term cinematic is overused a little, but to make something that's very visually appealing, make something that's, you know, you're watching, some, you're watching someone who is 3D in a 2D medium, shadows, is extremely important to make to create that kind of uh, that that kind of con uh, contrast to make you feel that way. So if I show you right from one is to one, two is to one, four is to one, eight is to one, you can see that as the amount of light is being taken away from her left cheek, it starts you, you're starting to increase the contrast. Um, where depending on the type of work you do, you will decide what amount of contrast is reasonable. For films, for I think a lot of uh, TVC commercials, uh, and I have to also justify what kind of TV commercials they are. Jerry, if you're going for something that's a bit raw, edgier, moodier, you're, you're, you're going deep into, uh, you know, like a thriller, like a storytelling, then I think a lot of times people actually work with something that's between four is to one all the way into 16 is to one. But if you're trying we to- We can do a live, live demo here. Yeah. <laughs> So it's essentially something like that, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the shadow. Yeah, exactly. So you're you're trying to put a little bit more light on one on, on one side of your face, and the other side you're making it a little bit darker. So it really depends. I think if you're doing a Skype conversation, keeping it one is to one, you don't need any kind of storytelling. You just want as much light as you can on your face. Maybe one is to one. But if you're trying to convey something that's positive, but you want it to look uh, a little bit cinematic as well, you want to convey uh, something that's positive, uh, probably something two is to one is usually quite safe to work with, right? So I think, Cassandra, you also get the idea by sort of moving the light around, you can decide, you know, uh, what kind of contrast you, you want to work with. But remember, uh, the right amount of contrast for the right kind of situation, yeah, right? Exactly. Okay. So now I'm going to come to the last part before we jump into the exercise of the day. We're still doing good on, good on time, Sandra? Yeah, about 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. So I'm going to cover, uh, this is the part where we talk a little bit about the color temperature and the color, right? So two things. Color temperature, I think some of you all probably already know, it has something to do with the white balance of your camera. Color temperature... In, in video and, uh, and, and film motion picture actually gives you an idea of the time of the day because when we see something like a street lamp, you know, something that's very tungsteny, we we are instantly reminded of street lamps. We are re reminded of uh, a nice dinner at the restaurant. You know, that's just kind of how our brain has been, you know, designed to recognize different light sources, right? Which is why sometimes people like to light their living rooms with tungsten lights because generally when someone looks at tungsten, you know, this kind of more orangey looking lights, they tend to be a little bit more calmer, more relaxed. On the numbers side, what that just means is that, you know, the warmer the light, meaning the more orangey it feels, the smaller the number. So something that's tungsten can, can range anywhere between 1,500 Kelvin, K just means Kelvin, all the way to 3,200 Kelvin. Then, of course, you need to know that on the higher end of the side where the color actually goes from something that's very orange to something bluer, right? Something bluer. So something like a moonlight could be somewhere easily in the 6,000 to 7,000 Kelvin. Uh, then you might ask, can it go beyond 7,000 Kelvin? Answer is yes, definitely can. On sci-fi films, uh, on certain music videos where we want to create a very uh, bluish kind of uh, futuristic kind of a look, uh, sometimes we do uh, use lighting that goes all the way to 10,000 Kelvin. 
And then you might be wondering, then where does sunlight falls? That's a great question because sunlight falls somewhere in the middle where it is white. So that is somewhere usually between 5,000 to 5,600 Kelvin. Okay, Jimmy, so that's cool, right? Now I have a really basic understanding of there's something like color temperature. How do I then apply that, you know, in, in what I'm trying to do? So let's look at some examples. Yeah. So some of you might recognize this background, maybe not the character, but you notice the color temperature, just the color temperature of this particular frame. It's how come the person's skin tone is looking a little bit warmer than than you would have expected. That's because the story of the storyline of this of this particular movie called Mad Max Fury Road. This uh, this film actually did go on to win an Oscars. Was set in the uh, was set in the setting of a, a, a really hot planet, and you can feel that heat even though you're not physically there because just by looking at the color temperature, it makes you feel that way as contrasted to something that is a little bit colder. So this was actually set more in a snowy, icy environment. Uh, there was a bit of, you can see that in the background itself, you know, with the character wearing extra pieces of clothing, you psych psychologically, it, it registers inside your head that this is a much cooler place. And of course, with, with the whites being adjusted a little bit more bluish, you're introducing more blues in the, in the whites. It makes you feel that the place is cold just by adjusting the color temperature. There are things that you can do to manipulate color temperature. I'm afraid uh, that may, we may not have enough time to cover that today. But anyway, I'm going to jump on very quickly to the next one, which is colors. Sometimes we refer to them as hues, right? Hues. They have the ability to affect different tone, mood, and the feel of the frame. I'm not gonna, I know this looks like a lot of information on screen that I just put in front of uh, you and it might look a little bit overwhelming. You just need to know that essentially this is actually a very important color wheel. It doesn't just apply only in stills of video. Even if you're a designer, pay attention and study the color wheel a little bit more. One, one very basic application that you can take away from this is, and it's being used a lot, is what we call something like complementary colors. So two colors that work together which are directly opposite sides of the wheel. So for example, red and green, or sometimes we refer to red as cyan, orange, uh, orange and uh, teal and blue sometimes people, uh, teal and orange, some, sometimes people refer to that, you know, but in, in our wheel, it shows blue and orange. These two colors can actually work together to create um, a very interesting looking image, color contrast. Um, and generally colors by themselves mean different things. In film, sometimes when you watch, uh, when you watch and pay attention to the objects, uh, to the fingernails. These are, now we're starting to talk a little bit about art design, but I'm not going to go too much into that. I just want you to pay attention to where the colors appear and where your eyes are being led. You can see that red sometimes can involve passion, danger, love. Blue has a calming effect. Uh, orange tends to feel, tends to be a very uh, positive, you know, vibrant, friendly color. And purple in this, you know, in this scene by, um, Emma Stone in La La Land, you know, it purple conveys royalty. You know, when you watch Frozen, you see a lot of Disney characters being portrayed in purple costumes. Purple generally, generally uh, represents royalty. Now, coming very quickly into our scene that we have over here. Um, now, if you actually just look at me, you can see that relatively, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to do a before and after, and I'm going to show you how you can use something like this to light, you know, wherever you're watching uh, from at home. Cassandra, do you have any questions? If not, I'm going to, I'm going to do the before and after. Okay, great. Okay. So just give me a moment. Now I, now you've, now you've seen the final look that I want to create for my home studio or, you know, late night setup. But what I'm going to do is I am actually going to show you how it looks like before. Right? Let's give Jimmy a second. Yep. It's going to show us the before. Okay. This looks like my experience. Very ordinary. <laughs> Boring room. It's, it's, it's very unflattering. Uh, you can see it for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one, remember, there is no, everything just looks very lit, right? There's no idea of uh, separation. Yeah, you can see that if I'm moving a little, you can see that I'm in front, but you can see that everything is pretty much, you know, uh, within focus, right? You can see everything is in, in the background. It just looks very landscape-ish. Uh. And what's more, the second thing, pay attention to where the shadows are falling. 
the light is actually coming from right overhead, which is one of the most unflattering ways to light a person because what you're going to end up is with is you're going to, you're going to hollow out the eyes. Yeah? So the eyes are going to look um, extremely dark and in a sense hollowed out, yeah, right? Hollowed out. Um, I don't see any light in the background as well. The background uh, generally is relatively boring, right? Uh, there's, there's no light that's falling upon it. So this is actually how a typical room looks like. I'm going to go from this into, now I'm going to start adding lights that you can see the difference. So let's say if you're working with something like this, the first thing you can do for yourself, and let's say it's, it's a nighttime, you know, nighttime interior scene, the first thing you can do for yourself is go and switch off the overhead light first. And so that's what I'm going to do, right? Uh, unfortunately, this has to be turned on by a switch. Manually. Yeah, I have to manually go turn it off. So, okay. So this is how it looks like, right? So we've turned the key, the, the main light overhead that's, that's, that's on. Now, you still, you still actually do see me, right? And then my question is, how, how are you still able to see me? Remember, uh, light actually comes from all over the places. It doesn't have to be always an artificial LED that we make here. Yeah? So you can see that I'm actually lit by the light that is coming from the monitor. It looks a little bit scary. It looks like you're stalking someone on Facebook, right? You've seen scenes like that, yeah, right? But, but anyway, that's not the point. Yeah? That's not the point. Um, uh, just need to know that right now you have one light source in the room and that's coming from the computer monitor. You know that it looks makes you look a little creepy. It makes you look a little bit quieter. It also depends on what your, your how good your camera is, whether you're using a Z6 or you're using your laptop's monitor. But anyway, just need to know that now you only have one light source. So what I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do here is I am going to add a light to create the idea of separation or, or depth. So the first thing you can do for yourself is turn off all the lights in your room and move yourself of as far as you can away from the wall, which is the one in the back. I want to create the idea that I'm in front, something is behind. So physically move yourself closer, uh, move yourself further away from the wall. And what I'm going to do in the wall is I'm actually going to add a light in the back, right? So I'm going to, that actually is not a real light, right? That's actually one of the Aperture's products. But anyway, let me turn it on first so you can see it. Um, and there you go. Oh, it's a bit too bright, so I can dim it down. So dim it really down here, right? How right. are you controlling that? Using exactly. your... so, great question. How am I controlling something like that? Yeah. Uh, that is actually using uh, um, Aperture's... This is actually our app that we built ourselves. It's actually called Ciders Link. This Ciders Link allows you control up to 100 lighting fixtures. It runs off Bluetooth. Um, it allows you to see the battery life of the light. If you're running the light off batteries, the app can show you. It can even tell you exactly, you know, uh, um, uh, where your light is by actually tapping on the, just by tapping on the little dot on the side, especially when you're working with multiple lights and you need to know which light is which light, just by tapping, it will flash and then you can tell exactly what light it is. Yeah. And we just need to know that uh, this is Bluetooth control, right? This can be Bluetooth control. You can literally be standing some, somewhere like, you know, uh, 50, 80 meters away and still be able to control the light. So now you're starting to get the idea that what we were really trying to do is we're trying to control where the light is falling. But anyway, before I change it to a color, let me just set it to something that's very familiar. So uh, I've set it to something that is a bit tungsten. Remember we learned about color temperature, something that's very warm and something that's very cool. So to create the idea, you know, to give the feeling that, you know, it's, it's a cozy little room, I've chosen to set that to 3200, yeah, right? So that is 3200, which is a tungsten uh, color temperature, right? Tungsten color temperature. So now with this, I have a light that's lighting my face and I have what we call a separation light, which is the table lamp in the back, yeah. the table lamp in the back. And let me just quickly show you the, this little, what, what is actually inside the, the lamp, right? right. So this uh, essentially is what it looks like, right? There is actually, it is actually not connected to power, right? It's not actually connected to power because there is actually, oh, it's, I think I have to turn it off first. So there's actually a physical bulb inside there. This bulb actually has an internal battery, right? So it's really designed for cinema usage because the fact that you can dim this, you can put it, you know, high up, you can use it without power. 
this is really a cinema bulb light, right? Cinema bulb light. Just need to know that. Um, yeah, it doesn't need battery to run, and I've just put it in the back as a separation light. So this is great, right? This is great. Now, if I look at the if I look at the scene, it still feels a little bit relatively dark and moody to it. Now my now my lights are relatively white and orange. You've learned you've also learned a little bit about when I mentioned color or hues, they have ability to affect your mood, right? So now if I want to create something that's very cool, someone who watches it is going to feel very comfortable, I will choose something like uh, something like blue, for example. It is very common to see something like that. So I'm going to inject a blue light and I'm going to put it on this side of my face because you can see that uh, I'm wearing something that's dark and I still want to be able to, 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 to sort of like show the silhouette, you know, of, of where, where I'm sitting in. I'm going to introduce this uh, light on the side. This is actually a tube light, right? It's actually like a tube. I'm going to show it, show it to you later. I'm going to put it on first. Uh, where is my tube light? Okay. Oh, it's a bit too, too much. Okay, let me just dim it, bring it down. Okay. Okay, so, so you can see that uh, instantly when I add the light on the side, it's still a bit too bright. I'm going to dim this down, right? Suddenly, I've introduced the idea of a fill light right, on, the, on the side of my face. Yeah. Right? Instantly, I, 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 I'm introducing the idea of mood inside my room, right? Uh, just to show you how it looks like, it's actually on the side. All right, let me just turn this off. And it looks like this. It looks essentially like this. So this is actually, this brand is actually called SGC. It's a partnership between Aperture and Quasar Science, right? Quasar Science is kind of the Hollywood of uh, tube brands, right? Essentially, when you've seen Transformers, you've seen ET, uh, if you've seen a tube being used in particular scene, it came from this brand called Quasar Science. So Aperture and Quasar Science sort of partnered together to build this, this standalone brand called SGC. Uh, the, the tubes itself can be controlled together by Cider's Link as well, right? So they can be manipulated, right, for different colors, right, depending on what you need, yeah, right? So they, they it looks all... like a lightsaber. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> right, as a lightsaber. So it's, it's extremely useful. Uh, tube lights are extremely useful for human subjects because when a person is standing, he is long, you know, elongated, just like how a tube light would be, right? So this is actually a very good light to light the silhouette of a person. So which is kind of why I'm using this to put it as a light to the side. I'm going to put this back on. Okay, cool. So now I'm 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 even happier than I was before with the with the with the earlier scene. Now what I'm going to do is now I'm, I'm looking at my image and I still feel that, you know, it's a little bit uh, grainy. I'm just going to add one more light, you know, in the, in the back. I have this little light that's sitting on top of my computer screen. And what it's really trying to do is, you notice that image has just gone away. It's just stopped being too grainy. The reason for that is because uh, the computer light wasn't bright enough, right, uh, to, to light my face. And therefore, I added another light on top of the computer monitor which is actually essentially a small little pocket light like this. This is the Aperture uh, MC, right? This light I'm putting in the computer to sort of bring up the intensity because the computer, uh, the, the, the light from the computer monitor isn't bright enough. And I, I sort of got that, put it there to bring up the over, uh, overall light. And you can see that the image has gone from this to becoming something less grainier. And I'm just going to quickly show you the before and after because I think we're starting to run late on time. Okay, I'm going to show you this. And then this is actually this is actually how the entire setup looks like, right? This is the before. This is actually how my room looks like. And yes, I do have quite a fair amount of soft toys. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that, 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 that's what happens when you're married. And, and then on the right-hand side, this is actually how it looks like. So you can see that the tube is over here. I've added in a little lamp on top of the monitor so that so that I, I, I mean, the, the computer monitor itself wasn't bright enough. So I added another light there to make it feel as though I'm, I'm from the computer monitor light. And I added another light in the back, which is the separation light. And just for, you know, fun, fun sakes, I wanted to just sort of inject a little bit more fun and environment to it, uh, in, into, the, into the setup. I added some fairy lights. So these are very affordable fairy lights that you can buy from any consumer brand out there. 
And uh, this pretty much just sums up the, the entire look. So you can definitely easily create something like this, you know, uh, inside, inside your room. And uh, if you're wondering by now, you know, why, why should you be picking Aperture? I've listed down a couple of reasons why. But uh, like I said, I hope today, at least everyone who's jumped, you know, who's kindly jumped into this session with us, I hope that you at least have learned and taken something away. You can, you can join us over in the Aperture Asia user group. So that's actually where our community is from. My name is Jimmy. Thank you, for, thank you Nikon, for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be on board. Thank you so much, Jimmy. That was very informative, you know, I'm sure all of us have learned so much, you know, uh, the, you know, essentially lighting is, is key, a key factor in producing high quality pictures. Uh, mm -hmm. It goes to show that, you know, it, it affects the visual mood, atmosphere and a sense of meaning for, for viewers. You know, and also seen in your sharing, uh, you know, lighting equipment has, has evolved to, to fit the growing demand of creator in, in this industry, the MC, you know, uh, the, the, in the F7, you know, yeah. um, you know, and many of your products are now very compact, user friendly, and designed to tailor to specific needs. And I hope all of you have, you know, learned something from the experience Nikon session tonight. Thank you once again, Jimmy, for for you know spending your precious uh, evening with us. And okay. and you know, to the viewers, thank you also for for tuning in and supporting us. Uh, please join us next week, same time, nine p.m. As our partner, Deity Microphones, will get you set up on quality audio in your videos. And thank you once again, everyone. Have a good week.